if you had to explain the term artificial intelligence in the most simple and layman way possible uh, say you had to explain it to my grandfather or someone how would you do it it's a great question why do we need artificial intelligence uh when we have like our human intelligence which is probably one of the strongest things on this planet right so does the does this whole ai world scare you i think it's extremely important that we think about the future hmm. even if we predict something that is not going to happen the mere act of thinking about it like seriously taking the time to like envision how it's going to look like and what's possible allows us to start conversations that might actually change and shape that future Mr. Mohammad Gash it's such an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me. Uh and uh, as uh, we have I'm super excited for today's topic because we'll be talking about artificial intelligence AI and it is such a near and dear topic to me being in tech and I know you have been an expert in this field and have done a lot of research and I felt there wouldn't be any guest other than you that will be more suitable to talk about this topic. I would uh say like I beg to differ actually thank you for the nice words but <laughs> I still think of myself as a student the field is moving very quickly okay and uh, we're all learning we're all learning that's right that's right and we are then that is one of the reasons why um we want to talk to you today and uh we want to talk about artificial intelligence so this term I feel it's uh people have their own definitions in their own ways some people are scared when they listen to this word term some people feel that oh this is just another stupid thing uh that is part of a technology so one thing that we want to do in this episode is we want to debunk uh and break down this term as much as possible make it simple for people to understand make them feel inspired talk about different areas and uh yeah at the end of the interview like you know hopefully people get away with it that you know artificial intelligence understanding that it's not that complicated <laughs> i agree and i think it's actually very hard to simplify so during the course of this conversation i might be grossly oversimplifying things for the sake of uh, just making them more as you said not that complicated um and some of the things i got for inspiration are actually two books that I would recommend everybody to read if they're interested okay. in like simplifying certain concepts in computers uh computer science machine learning and so on. Uh the first one is really good for a lot of science uh okay. explanations which is um Thing Explainer. Thing can, Explainer. Thing Explainer yeah by Randall Munro and you can see from the title and the size honestly like it's it's meant for actually having a um, really fun read. uh using only the top 1000 words we use in english like day to day lovely lovely so any yeah anything you can see here uh it's from the uh, authors of uh, author of xkcd okay. um and a lot of physics are included here and a lot of things you can see like for example uh if you want to explain something like a uh, helicopter how does it work or a data center for computers how does it work and so on so a data nice, center nice, is called nice. computer building right nice. and you can you can use that for physics and science and then building on that for ai specifically i really like this one it's called you look like a thing and i love you oh. i'm not gonna, <laughs> i'm not going to like you know spoil why it's called like uh this um cheesy title but it, it's fun it's nice. a very good one nice nice and as you said right as you love oversimplifying things maybe we should call you for another episode on uh, the art of simplifying things <laughs> but uh let uh, focusing on today's topic of uh, artificial intelligence and to start us off gesh uh if you had to explain the term artificial intelligence in the most simple and layman way possible uh say you had to explain it to my grandfather or someone how would you do it it's a great question so i actually used the tool that the author of the first book i mentioned okay provided online for people to go and simplify the words so i'm going to say it in the most possible way that i think uh as he call it less simple like even the word complex is not there in the top 1000 even yeah. the word 1000 is not in the top 1000 <laughs> so if you if you hear me say words that sound weird or do not go you know together in a smooth eloquent way that's because i'm using the tool to like make sure it's extremely simple it's not Perfect. that complicated so i would say that um humans always wanted to do more 
Mm. Right. Long time ago, when people just started to use numbers, they used their fingers to count. Mm. It was the simplest way to do so. And then they needed ways to keep track of bigger numbers. So mm. they used sticks to count. Mm. However, the sticks were not good enough as numbers got bigger and bigger. Mm. So people created the abacus. So abacus is one of the words that is less simple. It's you mm-hmm. know, a little bit complicated. Uh, it's a big word for counting and moving bigger numbers around. Okay. After that, people created smaller and faster calculators. Mm. Calculators is the last word I'm going to use that's mm. complicated in, in the sense of uh, top 1,000 words. So now that we have calculators, we actually build much, much, much faster calculators called computers, mm. which can work with hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of numbers okay. in one second. <laughs> <laughs> computers could be the best thing ever for numbers, mm. especially when you tell them exactly what to do and how to do it. Mm. Mm. We wanted computers to do more for us. Instead of telling them exactly what to do, we wanted them to learn like children do. Mm. To see, hear, read, and understand the many, many things that happen in the world. Mm. This was the beginning of fresh, great ways to teach computers so they can help us in ways that we thought were never possible before. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now we have better computers that can, in some ways, see, read, listen, talk and think mm. it can work outside of the office uh, they can help us drive cars buy things we would like more uh, find new jobs take notes on calls and so on okay thanks to computers 2.0 we can do much more now Beautiful. that's my explanation and i think we can go deeper you know in any, any of these areas uh, and i like actually to use the word or the phrase artificial intelligence in the context of augmented intelligence which is basically helping people do more interesting interesting so now there's one term uh, which from the definition that you just and uh, that was a wonderful well said uh, uh, way that you have put that um, one thing which i extracted from that is that you know we have to teach machines the way we teach our children right uh, so more of a question is that Why do we need to do that? Like, or or let me rephrase my question. What I'm trying to ask is, why do we need artificial intelligence uh, when we have like our human intelligence, which is probably one of the strongest things on this planet, right? So uh, do you, what is the bigger picture here that we are missing? I think it's close to the same case you can make for why do we need cars if we can run? Hmm. It's the extension of our abilities in ways and scale that uh, was never possible before, thanks okay. to the automation that computers allow us, you know, like uh, or computers allow allow today. Um, the idea of this augmentation of skill, it's an extension in both the, I would say, the vertical, um, the depth you can go and the scale of things you can you can do, but also the horizontal, the possibilities of things that were not fathomable before or uh, new applications that were um, harder or more expensive to do using human labor so Mm. if you think for example like how we can optimize so many industries like agriculture right Uh, thinking of like ways to like weed out you know um, like certain farms or things so that you know can grow in different places and you can optimize like which seeds to grow in which soils and analyze that on the fly and having drones you know uh maybe help like put up fires so all of these new ideas that were not possible before they were actually signed almost like sci-fi like right? mm-hmm. and now they are possible because of the ability to automate okay and and i think one thing which, uh, if I understand it right, correct me if I'm wrong, but this ability of automation is just helping us do tasks faster. Uh, like, it, it, is that a right understanding? Like, say, if we are analyzing an ag- agriculture farm or fire or something like that, like, you know, we are training the systems, but because we want faster results, is that the right way to put it? It's fast. It's like the... the um... Olympians motto, which I cannot remember right now, it's like faster, stronger, longer, you know, better. Uh, it's 
not just in in that direction, which is the vertical dimension, mm-hmm. but also I think they can enable and allow uses or use cases that were not possible before. Okay. Right. So the ability to actually have a let's say um, new applications, right, for a lot of a lot of industries that we can actually think about uh, that happened because of computers, for example, that were not happening, ahead, you know, before that. Mm-hmm. So think of like how we can today connect millions of people on the internet. Yeah, and that was not possible before because we did not have the infrastructure to do this at that scale. Okay, and uh, AI plays a role in that. Absolutely, I think for a lot of the times we think of. Uh, the heaps of data that we have uh, to sift through that and understand like new patterns and behaviors, we need a lot of interesting techniques and algorithms mm-hmm. or new ways of doing things that were not there before. And we saw a lot of interesting things in manufacturing, for example, like AI can enable us today to come up with shapes and appliances or applications that were not, you know, the fruit of a human cognition. It's okay. actually things that are very hard to reason about from mm-hmm. a human perspective. Uh, so if you think of certain like uh, robots, like surgical robots that can go in, into the body and like perform certain tasks mm-hmm. um, to actually get them into the specific shape or the specific um, kind of elasticity and like physical properties, mm-hmm. it was easier to do this with AI, like running simulations and coming up with um, optimized shapes and forms for for these robots to be in that, I would say, like you know, new purpose or new application that were not actually possible for the human brain to reason about earlier. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so um, now I, I think, as you mentioned, right, in the explanation, that it is no surprise that we have technologically advanced, like in the year twenty twenty one, when it comes to AI. Like, if I look at my room right now, I think. I have a assistant, I have my phone, the relevant algorithms, like you know, playing chess, you can play it with computer and everything. I think we are surrounded by AI or artificial intelligence, right? So if I have to ask you, you have been in this field, uh, uh, how fast do you think, like what is the graph looking like when we are, when it comes to evolvement of AI? And uh, uh, to ask you a little more of a deeper question is that, where do you see like what is going to happen in the field of AI in next decade? So I have actually a couple of talks on, on this very specific question, and it's mm-hmm. going to be harder for me to like shrink it into a few minutes, but I'm going to try. Okay. I think it's extremely important that we think about the future. Mm. Even if we predict something that is not going to happen, the mere act of thinking about it, like seriously taking the time to like, envision how it's going to look like and what's possible allows us to start conversations that m- might actually change and shape that future mm. in a way mm-hmm. so instead of being the passenger you become more in the driver's seat at least you have to navigate okay so i think you know one of the things we we should actually look into is the past and the trajectory or the acceleration of how things have been moving and there are three main ingredients I, I'd like everybody to look through and understand their past and trajectory. Data, so that's mm. how much we have been actually generating in terms of records mm. and how we digitize them. And the new kind of data that has been happening or you know surfacing now because of the use of like social networks and so on. Mm. The second one would be the computation and power, right? Like mm. the, scale of computers that we have today and the power they have individually and collectively Mm -hmm. and the ubiquity of that as well like all the sensory data that we have uh coming from you know small like internet of things devices as you said like a smart speaker uh your you know uh, wristband that might be uh, generating a lot of data and has some computational power on it as well and then the third one would be the techniques, the research, the algorithms, the steps we use to actually, what we call like crunch the data, like understand Mm -hmm. from the data, new things. And these have also been following like a very, I would say fruitful trajectory 
people mm-hmm. are um, more interested in making things happen at larger scale and uh, make use of more of the data and compute. And that's actually, I think, is the connective tissue that's very important, the, the people element, the human capital that's driving these three factors altogether. So if you think of like how things have changed in each of every aspect of the three, as I just mentioned, you would see like there's definitely a faster trajectory or faster acceleration over time. Uh, for example, data, I took, I took a very simple, like, you know, individualistic approach to like how much of my digital footprint was in the world in the 80s yeah. and I was like none uh, I might have like you know paper records but not digital records at least for me personally mm. and then in the 90s when you start having personal computers and you start having maybe files spreadsheets word documents and so on but they're not really still they're isolated they're you know living on your small like hard disk hard and it's not really connected to the rest of the you know yeah. computers on the internet even in the late 90s you might be connecting to chat or have you know um emails and whatnot uh, transferred over the internet but the power of like your you know digital footprint being ever present and important to your yeah. existence it's it's not you know clear yes. yet yes and then into the 2000s and things have taken a drastic shift in the way we're actually dealing with data and generating data and storing data and thinking about the power of data actually uh, and the recommendations and helping you find things that you might like more or like new jobs and connecting people together and so on. And then now it's just everywhere. Like mm-hmm. your car generates data, your um, wristband generates data, your watch generates data. Uh, by the way, I'm talking to you like my ring is a smart ring it's generating data right now it's connected to the cloud my glasses are connected to the cloud you know it has alexa on it the whole world is going to be like and of course we cannot you know forget the biggest maybe mover um in the late 2000s so like uh um until now is your mobile phone which is really a a supercomputer in your pocket right Yeah. yeah so when we talk about like you know something like uh the neural engine on uh, your iPhone that has 11, I'm going to use one more, like, you know, uh, less simple word or yeah. a complicated word, a trillion operations per second, right? So yeah. that's the the 600s I, I mentioned in succession. It's a lot of power in your pocket. It can do a lot more than, you know, the space shuttle that uh, first like left uh, to the moon or uh, sorry, the outer space and the, and the rockets we, sp- we sent yes, to the moon and yes, so on. Yeah. So that's that's just amazing how you know compute power data and research have been evolving and i think we are seeing that acceleration um getting faster and faster as we go the next years i don't, i think anything that we predict is going to be really hard to get right but it's very important that we predict and be in the mindset of like we want to help that acceleration happen in the shape and form we would like it you know to manifest in the next decade. I see. So, so if I have to summarize uh, that uh, information that you gave, right? So, for basically, the way we are, the, the amount of data that we have been creating, especially after two thousands, right? That has been an exponential graph. Like you know, there's just a lot of data that is just coming in. Uh, so, there are three things that you mentioned. One is that the data that is coming in, the digital data, photographs and uh, phones, smartphones, everything. Uh, another is then feeding that data, and the third is analyzing that data, and and uh, just a combination of that, uh, we need to do more and more. Uh, I I don't want to ask one question. I know you mentioned that uh, we are coming more on the driver's seat as compared to the passenger seat. Isn't it counter? Aren't you like no? Isn't AI actually helping you? Uh, like like say self driving cars, right? <laughs> it is helping you be in the passenger seat so that AI takes the driving seat, right? Isn't, isn't that... Yeah. In, in the actual manifestation of the analogy in the real world, you want to be in the driver's seat, but leaning backwards, yeah. or leaning back and relaxing, maybe enjoying, you know, a uh, nice show on the big screen and uh, yeah. some popcorn, but you still want to have your hands... Like, uh, yeah. This yeah. time of, you know, like how uh, AI is performing, I think it's still smarter actually and wise to have your hands on the steering wheel just in case. Yeah, just in case. But I agree with you. Yeah, the the analogy I use is actually for like the 
machine learning and AI practitioners mm. to be shaping the future of AI. Got and it. Oh, I driving see. us there. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. No, I think that is definitely important that we have to be responsible. That's on a funny, funny side. Um, so I was just talking to my friend who is in non non tech background, right? And uh, I was explaining that, oh, uh, look at the amount of computer computing power that we have. We can do this. You have assistance for this. And then, like, in a very innocent way, he asked, what are you going to do with all that free time? <laughs> it's always been the question, by the way. Like, people before used to travel between countries in months. And, you know, of course, we have transportation now that uh, yeah. I made mean, it much, much shorter in time. I, I think it's a question of, like, how can we elevate the activities that we do um, and the time that we spend on things that I think are less mundane. Yeah. So AI, AI is actually great for taking care of the mundane for mundane us. Mundane things, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. So basically we'll, we'll adapt it and we'll figure it out <laughs> of how we want to get rid of mundane and actually put ourselves in much more interesting things. Okay, so now getting going a little bit on a deeper it's like a layer of onions and i'm like peeling one after the other uh, so going a little bit on a deeper level now when we talk of ai when you talk of artificial intelligence there are two terms which are very hot and it comes to people's mind one is machine learning and another is deep learning uh, i wanted to understand from you uh, what is the definition of each and what is the difference between the two yeah so we talked really um very very briefly on machine learning, which is basically teaching machines to understand in the simplest form um, patterns that um, by looking at a lot of and a lot of examples, they can actually help us understand newer examples that the machine has not seen before. Mm. Right. So we talked about like, um, hey, why is this important? Uh, because earlier, the way we have been using computers is we've been telling it exactly what to do. That's programming. We tell it the rules and we tell the computer exactly like how to like handle input. Yep. Whether it's like, you know, it's say an image and we want to know what kind of image uh, or object in the image uh, there is. So it's much, much harder to come up with a set of rules for other tasks uh, that the computers were not programmed to do specifically or mm -hmm. even for things that are a more, uh, I would say, perceptual tasks like understanding speech, understanding images, understanding um, uh, natural language, the way we speak and the way we write and so on. So unless you program the machine to tell it exactly how to operate, it becomes harder uh, for it to come with something new outside of that realm of possibilities. Okay. And that's what machine learning allows us to do. So we can train the machine, teach the machine based on a lot of examples. Okay. Hey, that's a dog. It's another dog. And then okay. they show it a million dogs. And now it can actually recognize that, oh yeah, that's a dog. While if you write a lot of rules, like, oh, the size of the eye, the position of the eye, uh, the nose and snout and so on, it becomes far more complicated than anything else that, you know, right. and it's not as effective as learning by examples. Okay. So, so just, just yeah. a, a quick pause right there. So uh, from what I understand, what you just told is that basically telling the machine, giving different sample sets and examples uh, that, hey, you're, this is the data set. Here is a dog. Here, is, here are different types of dog. And analyzing all of them, a uh, machine will understand that, okay, it'll conclude that, oh, next time when I see an unknown dog picture that I have not seen before, I can safely conclude that it is a dog. Is that right? Yes and no. So okay. I, I don't want to go. I don't want to go into the details, the deep details. But I think somebody like Richard Feynman and uh, Noam Chomsky, both of them had a very interesting say, like something to say about using our words and using our language. Yeah. And um, kind of superimpose that or project that on the machine. For example, when we say an airplane flies. Yeah, it doesn't flap its wings, <laughs> oh, okay. but it still, yeah, it still gets you there. It doesn't matter what fly means, yes. right? The mechanics of flight are not that important for that action. And when you said the word understand, I just wanted to take a you know a second here to like explain that why it does not necessarily understand in the same way our human Makes brain, sense. you know, reason about the world, but we simplify that and we just use the same kind of analogy of like. Airplanes Lovely. fly and computers understand or think. Lovely. So, yeah, in a way, it's just a way to tell computers, like, 
here are a lot of examples learn from that and you give them feedback you say good, good job bad job and bad they job. kind of adjust how do you reason about you know the input Brilliant. and the world yeah and then that's that's ex- machine learning you know which yes. is a superset it's a uh, that science or you know set of methods and techniques and then deep learning is a great marketing term for a subset of that okay so without going into the history which you know a lot of people like talk talk about like the neural networks in the 80s and how they got resurrected in uh, the early uh, 2010 like around 2012 2013 um, let's just talk about deep learning from that time from the okay. late tw- you know 20 10 or uh, t- sorry from the 2012 okay. uh, 2013 time frame which is basically a uh, a way to like use more data and more computational power to do things that machine learning was not really doing before at the same level of uh, accuracy or effectiveness efficacy hmm. and that enabled specifically um, certain perceptual tasks like speech recognition computer vision and so on mm. uh, to be more accurate to be more useful and the reason why the word deep is in there has to do with the kind of technique that's being used uh, which actually is a little bit inspired by the biological way of like how like let's say your eye works uh, how the retina has uh, uh, multiple layers let's call it let's call it layers of uh, um, the neurons or the way you actually your your vision system processes like imagery mm. and depth is in, as in deep is actually coming from the layering of these you know different uh uh let's call them like you know cells or neurons okay uh, in, a, in a neural network and you can see a, a lot of the t- terms and jargon we use is actually heavily inspired by how the brain works and how the uh um, uh, like signal travel travels through our nervous system and and brain and so on, uh, except that they're not actually analogous. It's not one to one mapping. Mm. It's all of like inspiration between the two. Beautiful. Uh, I think thanks for the detailed explanation there. Uh, in there. So um, now one thing. Uh, switching gears a little bit. One thing which I wanted to talk about was uh, so when we are training our models, right, or machines. Uh, we are basically giving a data set to it, right? Uh, now, I want to learn from you and understand uh, that how is bias uh, produced in an AI or an artificial intelligence operation? And uh, is it the same as what we listen, what we hear cognitive bias? Um, are they the same thing? Or what is your understanding on cognitive bias and bias in models? Yeah, so the word is actually overloaded. Bias in machine learning is actually the ability for the model um, to learn. Without that, it it cannot learn. So there's something we usually refer to as the um, bias variance trade-off. And I'm not going to go into the the details of that, but it's actually different from bias in psychology and uh, behavioral economics that is more about uh, fault in decision-making because humans are irrational. However, I actually see a lot of Cognitive bias in the way we make decisions about the machine learning techniques that we should follow, statistics, um, and really the rigor or the way of thinking that could leak into not just machine learning, by the way, software engineering processes, Mm. software decision making. um, And because at the end of the day, we are programming, we're responsible for the AI. We're programming it to do things that we think are useful for us and and, and the society, you know, Overall, I think we need to be aware of both the okay. bias that we can bring from psychology, right? From uh, decision making and how we actually look at. There's another dimension which is uh, uh, equity and making sure that fairness yes. are part of the objectives. And that is coming from the human trainers, right? Like when we it's are from in the life. data. Okay. It's coming from the yeah. From the it's okay, it's okay. the data and our responsibility to make sure that. Uh, we are the guardians of the behavior. There's safety nets. There are safety nets around and guardrails, guardrails around what you know the machine can actually um, produce in a way. Right. So one of the things that 
you know, we did, for example, in um, like transcription of meeting notes is making sure that when, of course, it's not perfect and it's going to make mistakes. Yes. Uh, so let's say if it makes a mistake because it misunderstood or mistranscribed a word and it just so happens that it mistranscribed that into a curse word, yeah, you really don't want to show that to the user okay. or the reader, right? So yeah. how can you have these safety nets when an AI doesn't do the proper job? And by the way, this is <laughs> going back to this, you know, uh, I'm not going to spoil it as I promised, but you should maybe link it now. Yeah. Look like a thing and I love you. That's actually part of these uh, funny stories that happened because of AI Interesting. misbehaving. Okay. You know, we'll, we'll definitely put this link in the video description also. Uh, uh, okay. So from what um, I understand uh, in the explanation that you just gave is that uh, as humans, first of all, it is our responsibility that we are inculcating that level of ownership. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, more than ownership, I think it's a responsibility that we have to portray when we are developing these machines. And then another is the data set. Like, you know, how do we make sure uh, that the data set is, uh, I think, is, is the solution here that we have to make sure as humans that the data set that we provide is diverse enough. Is that the solution here? I think we are responsible for the output and the outcome of uh, very like, highly impactful algorithms and systems. Oh, lovely, okay. So yeah, I think uh, I scratched the word algorithm and just focus on systems because it's yeah. really about the you know overall end-to-end -end thing. So at the end of the day, if you bake a cake and all the ingredients were good on their own, yes. but the interactions between them caused people to get sick, I, I think you're responsible. To stop that cake. Okay. Oh, yeah, or if it doesn't appeal to others, and you know, maybe cake is not a great example because it sounded like you know not as uh, crucial, right? Yeah. But if it's a crucial, you know, yes. uh, system, like it's something that's going to be used to like treat a disease or you know um, be part of the legal process and the legal system, the level of scrutiny should be much much higher than let's say recommending um, music, right? Okay. So that. Yeah, the higher the impact or the more important the system is, the more scrutiny in the way you think about the ramifications. Like if you're going to send the space shuttle out to space and, you know, uh, have a lot of, uh, uh, you have a lot of responsibility on your shoulders because of the lives of people who are going to be on it. And also mm -hmm. because of the, you know, just immense amount of uh, responsibility that comes with that. There's a lot of um, I would say cost and different yes. aspects yeah, you need to consider. Sure. Yeah, versus like you know, recommending a track for you on on your iPod. Uh, nobody has an iPod anymore on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, so that, a question, that, a question, your Gesh. Uh, and so, are you saying that you can give the right data set? You can do the most responsible thing when training the systems and everything is right in the input level, and yet the output could be different and not enough. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Okay. <laughs> At the time you collected the data to train your model, maybe you did not think about the specific use case that only came to happen later on. Because mm. you know things mm. change. It's it's the constant thing. Change is the constant thing, right? Okay. So a lot of the challenges also happen in machine learning that a system that's created for a specific purpose, if that purpose shifts even a little bit, yeah, it will start seeing in a different output that was not expected before. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, nice. Uh, I think that's a, a very brilliant way to put that. Uh, now, another thing that I wanted to talk about, which I think uh, you have a, a good enough knowledge on, um, and that is the human-centered designs, right? Uh, so what what exactly is human-centered designs when it comes to AI? Like, can you, can you explain it to us? So let's take actually a quick example from the real world first. Okay. And I think that's a great example because I see it more often than any other example. Yeah. And uh, it's been the topic of discussion for a lot of designers. Uh, it's from a book and a lot of you know uh, research that uh, uh, Dr. Norman, I think is at Berkeley uh, teaching design or used to at least. Um, it's called the Norman door after him because mm. he, he describes it as the door that requires documentation, the door that requires a sign, 
because a door is maybe one of the most basic things that you will encounter yeah. and you have a lot of them all over the place so i think a lot of us have faced this issue before when you like just in your busy day at least before covid you're running around yeah. and, uh you're you know trying to get through a door so maybe it has a handle and you instinctively pull yeah right so that's called affordance affordance is like there's something that's presenting itself to you in the real world and it just screams at you like pull, pull me yeah yeah I'll pull so you try and it just doesn't work and you like maybe <laughs> hit your you know like head or something that what's going on like uh, maybe yeah. maybe something is mi- missing but then yeah. you see the sign and it says push, push. <laughs> which is not making any sense because if you want me to push you could just have a panel and i could yeah. push against it yeah so that's the same thing with a lot of software actually if you think about it like we have been trying to get humans to work with the limitations of software and uh, what we call like human computer interaction Mm. so we have been training a lot of humans right along the years to work with computers with ai because now they can see read listen talk it's actually gonna flip it's gonna be like okay computers are gonna learn to understand us as we go about our day-to-day activities Mm. so with the ubiquity of you know these like smart devices smart services smart cars smart everything you would go about your life and just talk to them as if they're you know they're your sidekick and you're in this like uh futuristic kind of uh you know maybe sci-fi movie where everything just like works it just works for you. smoothly uh, for you yeah. right yeah. and you don't have to worry about like repeating yourself or like um something frustrated because that's the frustration i was referring to in the norman door phenomena which is it didn't work it should have just intuitively worked so when we're designing for humans we have to understand what the you know the the real world experience is like instead of the intent behind the designers or the software you know uh developers goal so Mm. it should be actually afforded to you in real life that you can interact with all of these systems assistants um and ai systems in a smooth like you know user centric manner beautiful beautiful okay yeah i mean i can't wait for that future <laughs> so uh now gesh uh one thing uh more of a philosophical question a little bit tangential which i wanted to ask you was uh does the does this whole ai world scare you um I, i have a follow up question after this and why i'm asking this but on a personal level like you know with the way things are changing in our world does it scare you and why or why not it scares me that we might actually hit a plateau and not get there not the other okay. way around okay <laughs> okay it scares me that it could be the case uh that the advances in ai are in the hands of very few you know let's say players because of the cost of doing it at large scales today um not a, you know unlike other industries like the diamond i i'm not an expert by any means or stretch of imagination yeah. and uh, the the pseudo monopoly it's happening in certain industries uh but i think that it scares me that you know the research um needs to get to a place where it becomes more democratized and as affordable as software is today like mm. the traditional way of like writing programs and uh, role based systems that you can teach at schools you can teach and have fruitful advances for folks who can take that and disseminate the information and uh, the ways of thinking about ai and actually seeing the fruit of the work the same way you can do this today with a laptop and just knowledge yeah. i like to see the democratization of knowledge and democratization of access to ai at large scale and the things that we do today in the hands of everybody who is interested okay so so from what i understand you're trying to say that uh let's try not to hit that plateau uh let's make sure that we are uh making our role as responsible as possible when it comes to ai development and that also starts somewhere 
like you know we need we will need more people as the future generations come in is that right yeah we need new techniques that can work at a much lower price range oh, got it second. got it okay yeah. okay okay so uh, on that note what is like say if you had like a bunch of teenagers and school kids right now in front of you and uh, you had to inspire them to get into ai like you know what would be your learnings for them and what is the message that you have for today's kids and and teenagers i think the most important thing is that you make learning a habit so it just become it becomes a second nature kind of thing for you like you don't think about brushing your teeth you don't, you don't think about like you yes. know decision responsibilities so you, you do day to day even like you know if it's weekly or just pick a cadence um and have fun while you're doing it if okay. it's not fun you're not going to be able to persevere you're not going to have that kind of uh passion that fuels you to do more of that and over time it will actually cause like this um compound interest so you'll you'll feel like in the beginning you, you will be feeling in the beginning that it's an uphill battle yeah and it, it is it's hard it's really hard because it requires a lot of learning but start with something that's going to give you this um uh, dopamine you know those like yes. it's this like reward you're gonna get a reward because you see reward. it you can yes. actually play with it and have fun with it uh so start with a project do something that's fun and have you know somebody who can mentor you and help you along the way mm. and also have like a few bodies that you can actually uh use as a support system and encourage each other and collaborative projects are great because everybody brings a different perspective no ideas, yeah. and yeah and you know if you can actually see like there are a lot of options to do this um using stuff like raspberry pi uh jitsen from nvidia they're small computers like between 30 and 60 dollars okay. okay that you can get to do a lot of interesting things whatever like you know robotics or um uh like small projects like a smart meter and so on yeah. so whether you use that for machine learning or not um I think that Jitsen is more machine learning, you know, because of the um uh, GPU is on it, but it's good to have these like small like uh I'd say hacker kits that yep. you can use to like you know yep. build things and you don't have to use like you know somebody's computer or a laptop that's uh your primary thing and you can actually put it on a maybe car and it can drive yeah. itself and yeah. so on. Yeah. So have fun, have you know a mentor, have buddies with you and do it have truly and do it uh, consistently. So so start experimenting start playing around with your things and and see if yeah. that is something that uh, you really like I like I love the one sentence that you told is that make learning a habit right and I feel this paradigm shift a lot of people including adults need to make that learning is a habit that you there world is will be evolving uh technology will be changing what you know today will be ancient in a decade uh so you have to be uh, you have to have that mindset open in such a way that you are learning which brings me to that next question which i had reserved for the very end and that is what do you think when people say oh ai is is just going to steal our jobs uh what what do you have to say for that so if we think of like how different revolutions like the industrial industry revolution has changed certain jobs have evolved these revolutions have evolved a lot of jobs into new jobs and naturally some jobs disappeared yes so one of the examples i i usually give people like you know when um bowling first you know first appeared or was uh, invented as a sport or activity um there was actually manual labor involved in like restacking or uh, repositioning the uh, the bins that you drop and pull with right so where did that go it was mechanized mm. right now you don't see it anymore mm. uh, a lot of you know specific jobs like um there was actually a job i guess in the beginning of cars and and cities and uh certain roads you had to have somebody run in front of the car i think waving a flag or something warning people that the car is coming well oh, okay. obviously we don't have this anymore mm. so certain jobs we created out of necessity and because there was no better alternative but if you had a better alternative at the time like a honk right it's not that hard to actually displace or replace um 
the job because it did not make sense to continue yes. given the new alternative. And then people had to figure out a way to actually change their, I would say, like learning or expertise mm-hmm. and build expertise in certain things and maybe like shift careers or not necessarily entirely, but maybe improve what they do so that they up level or elevate the the job itself and yes. what it means to be in the job. I think of AI is no different. It could be actually more uh, capable than you know the things we mentioned in uh, in the past um, because of the power of the data and computational power behind it and so on. It could be of a bigger impact, but I think that we're not there yet where you have to worry so much about worry it. So much. Okay. And yeah, I think it's also, again, like our responsibility as we see like how certain domains and certain industries are going to be affected to train people to use their transferable skills Mm. to either go deeper into that job and as i said like elevate what it requires to be good at the job and play that role or find a specific job that could actually contribute to that uh AI revolution itself. So, you know, a lot of the mechanization and industrial revolution um, side effects were maybe compensated for by having like now new jobs were created as well. Like you need uh, mechanical engineers, you need like folks who can go and maintain these machines and so on. So just like it displaced certain jobs, it also created new jobs. And I think the job shift, you know, the market for jobs is going to continue to evolve and change. A few years ago, we didn't have a job as a social media, you know, mm-hmm. manager or somebody who actually understands how to deal with like, you know, certain new things that yeah. were created recently or data labeling and so on. So mm-hmm. you will see both of the same kind of, uh, uh, I, th- I think, t- like opposing uh, forces Shift operating happening. yeah, to balance each other. I want to go back to the previous question because I think that's such a great way to end because it's going full circle from the second you introduced me and I said, Yes, we're not experts. We're all learning. And I think it's such an important thing that if you want to keep your job, it's not sufficient anymore to like stay put. You actually have to go twice as fast, yep. right? So I like this um, um, saying from, I think it was the Red Queen in uh, Alice in Wonderland. Um, you have to run to stay in place and you have to go twice as fast to move forward okay. and i think this is very applicable and i can't top that so i'm gonna stop yeah. here and I, I hope that actually works well no for that's good to that's take good. away that's okay. the take away so, so i mean uh, like i mean in, in that sense let, let me just like there's one wrapping up question that i usually do on the show and that is the three recommendations and the three ctas right so now this show is called it's not that complicated and the whole idea is that you know we make things simple and i think you did a fabulous job there so now to end it up uh, if you had to uh, summarize the understanding of artificial intelligence in three points uh, how would you do that for our audience okay in three points i would say the first thing is ai is your friend hmm. you know get to know it and get familiar with it so okay. that you can help each other. So we are going to help AI to help us. Beautiful. And it's a virtuous circle. The second one is continue to learn and understand that the world is ever changing. Mm. So if you stay where you are, you're going to be left behind. You need to move twice as fast to move forward. Beautiful. And the third one is to continue watching what you're presenting and discussing with others i think this podcast is no. <laughs> helping the first two cases so like subscribe and oh yes uh, ring the bell <laughs> so yeah, here you go well, <laughs> lovely lovely uh, it was su- such a wonderful way i lo- i love that overall on a high level uh, i love that biggest learning from your personality and your uh, teaching so that always be open to learning there'll be new challenges coming ai is your friend uh, leverage it for the human evolvement as compared to being scared and uh, just develop along with it so gesh thank you so much for coming on the show it was such an awesome time talking to you and learning everything about ai thank you for having me